So here we are. My name is Mr. Jackson. I'm Miss Hughes. And this is our uh, first lesson in unit number seven. Uh, it's our unit on two variable statistics. So up until now, what we've looked at, if you've been following along, is we've looked at presenting and collecting data. Yep. We've looked at statistics of one variable, including measures of central tendency. And dispersion. And relative position. Yep. And now we're moving into two variable statistics where we're going to look at one set of data which represents one variable and another set of data representing another variable and the relationship between them. Yes. So to begin this unit, we're talking about um, correlations, specifically linear correlation, and scatter plots. Um, we've done some graphing already in Unit 5. And, and we'll use that some more in this We're going to use well. that a little bit more, and we're going to expand upon that um, a, little bit, a little bit later on in this lesson. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions to get started. Sure. I mean, the whole point of data analysis is to take observations of the world around you, put them together, and try to make some predictions. As a species, we like to try and predict the future yes, if we can. Yes, exactly. And we also like to see what relationships exist in terms of cause and effect or common cause, which we'll get to later. But there are, there are questions that plague us. Yes, like does ice cream consumption... Cause crime. Okay, this is an important question. It is. Are older people paid more in cottage country? Are the sales of small businesses affected by the amount of precipitation? If you were a small business in cottage country, this would be an important question to you. Yeah. Uh, these questions deal with possible relationships. Some of them silly, some of them likely, yeah. between two variables. Now, often the answers are not clear cut because there are so many other variables that could interfere. But in this unit, unit 72 variable stats, we're going to investigate methods for doing a few things. We're going to try and detect if a relationship exists between two variables. We're going to try to develop a mathematical model, like an equation, yep. um, of those relationships. And then we're actually going to do a third thing. So maybe write this into your note. The third thing is we're going to try to then use those models, use those formulas and equations to make predictions exactly. about the future. So we detect the relationship, we develop a model, and then we try to make predictions. So to begin, though, we need to look at scatter plots because this is another area of um, graphing data um, that we need now to use because our histograms that we did before are not going to show... Histograms, of course, show frequency of one variable. Well, now we kind of need to show the frequency of one variable and the frequency of another variable... At the same time. At the same time. Yep. And... Um, uh, Histograms are good for showing one bit of information. Scatter plots, though, can show us an independent and a dependent variable at the same time. Yeah. So what is a scatter plot? Well, the way that we define it and the way that your textbook defines it is a graph with one variable plotted on the x-axis and another variable plotted on the y-axis. And, of course, this is the type of graph that, have, that you would have seen, right? And perhaps not called a scatter plot, but... This is, you know, the kinds of graphs that you've been making in science, the kind of graphs that you've been making in math for a long time. One variable's on the x, one variable's on the y, and the pattern in the data shows the relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. So let's get to what we put on the x and the y, so the independent variable. So the independent variable goes on the x-axis. It's the variable that we think will affect the value of the other one. So in, in terms of time, we might say that the independent variable comes first, and then the dependent variable comes second, or that what happens to the independent variable or the x variable will have an effect or will have some kind of result on the y variable or the dependent mm -hmm. variable. So we, and we're making a hypothesis, mm -hmm. uh, we're asking a question, we say, well, maybe ice cream causes crime. So mm -hmm. then ice cream would be the independent variable. Yeah. And then crime rate would be the dependent variable. If we think yeah. ice cream causes crime, if we think crime causes ice cream consumption to go up, maybe people feel guilty yeah, the and they go out and buy a pint of haagen to and make they themselves could. feel better, then we would have the crime rate on the x-axis. So it all depends yeah. on your hypothesis, but we yeah. put the x-axis independent variable, the one we think affects the other one. Okay. In science, what we would generally say is, is that an independent variable is what's controlled by the experimenter. Yeah. It's what I'm going to change or manipulate and then what I'm about to measure is the y variable. Is the, the dependent dependent. variable. Yeah. So the dependent variable then is, is a variable whose value is affected by something else. And that usually goes on the y-axis. Okay. So a linear correlation then 
is a relationship where we can say changes in one variable are proportional to changes in the other variable. So say if something goes up by X number of units, then the dependent variable would go up by a proportional number of units and that proportion remains intact. So yeah. if I go up by two units here and I go up by so many units here, then that proportion stays constant as I go up. And if you were to graph this on a scatter plot, this would be represented by a straight line. Right. And the proportion that we're talking about in terms of these proportional changes would be the slope. So if you're thinking yes. of y equals mx plus b, the m would be that proportion that keeps changing. And so it is proportional. So a little bit of a change in x would result in a little bit of a change in y and so on. And we'd see that as a line. So a line of best fit is um, a line that it's a straight line that passes closest to the data points on a scatter plot. And so the way that we've always done this, you know, in grade 9, grade 10 science, grade 9, grade 10 math, is that when we create and when we draw a line of best fit, we eyeball it. And we say, okay, well, it should pass through as many points as possible. Same number above is below Same as number possible. above is below, and it should represent. Well, we're going to take the concept of the line of best fit to a new level in this unit. And, and in lesson three in particular. And lesson two, lesson three, two. Lesson yep. two in particular. Yep. And we're going to find, um, by way of data analysis, we're going to find the mathematically correct line of best fit. So not eyeballing it. We're going to predict the equation mathematically that tells us what the slope of the line of the best fit is and what the y-intercept is so that it's, it's not a guess anymore. It actually uses the data and predicts perfectly what we'd have. Yeah. So look forward to that. So here's an example, um, example one, of a huge study. And so um, basically this example goes that statisticians in Victorian England so this is, you know, 100, 150 years ago, were fascinated by the strength of resemblance between children and their parents. So they didn't know a lot about genetics at this point. No, But they thought it was amazing how much children looked like their parents. And so they collected scores and scores of data on these relations between yeah. parents and their children. And so they decide, you know, if you were to look at all this data just as a list, it would have very little meaning. It would be an overwhelming yeah. list of numbers. But if you take each point is a father-son pair, yeah. and the father's height is on the x-axis, because we do think the father's height affects the son, not the mm -hmm. other way around, mm -hmm. um, then each point is the father's height is the x value, and the son's height is the y value. And then we can see that as father's heights get taller, as father's heights increase, then son's heights tend to follow a similar pattern. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always happen, but in general, the data would predict from this graph mm -hmm. that, oh, okay, well, we can see an upward trend in this data, yep. right? So as a list, we can't, we wouldn't be able to recognize this, especially when we're dealing with 1,078 fathers and sons, so 1,078 data points. Yeah. In a list, we just couldn't imagine this, but a scatter plot can be much more descriptive, and in this case, it is because we can generally see the trend of this data yep. is you it's know trending upwards. Is trending upwards. And imagine too, if you would, that this is a data cloud, and if you were to draw an oval around the data cloud to try and capture it that the oval would have this upward tilt to it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and the oval would be sort of a wide oval, right? Yeah. Which means that it's not tight into the line. It's, you know, mm -hmm. the, the skinnier the oval would be, the closer to the line, the better the line would be at predicting. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, the slope of the data cloud, the shape of the data cloud is an upward sloping kind yeah. of linear relation, yeah. okay? And as we said before, we think fathers come first, so. Uh, yeah, so the, the independent group. variables here, <laughs> And of course, then that makes sun's height and inches the dependent Deep variable. variable. Okay. So um, we should probably talk about classifying linear correlations because, um, you know, how, how would we classify? What, basically, what we've said is, oh, this, the trend in the previous example was, well, it was an upwards trend, but upwards in which direction? And really, we should, we should find some ways to be more precise about how we classify these correlations. And so what we can say is that variables tend to have a linear correlation if changes in one variable are proportional to changes in the other, as we've described. 
So the stronger the correlation, the more closely data points will cluster around the line of best fit. And as we noticed in example one, was it a strong correlation? Well, perhaps, but it, really those data points didn't cluster around the line of best fit. They were pretty spread out. Yeah. Um, linear correlations are classified according to their direction, positive and negative, and their strength. You can have no correlation between two sets of data, and that would be a correlation of zero. You could have a weak correlation, a moderate correlation, a strong correlation, and in some instances, very few probably, but in some instances, a perfect correlation, which would be rated as a one. Yeah. So therefore, correlations fall between zero and one. Positive, Positive. correlation then right. means that data clouds slope up yeah. as one variable increases, so does the other. Negative correlation, on the other hand, would be that the data cloud slopes down. As one variable increases, the other decreases. decreases. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple examples of what these mean now, now. Yeah. so that you can kind of see, oh, that's what it would look like. And then we'll find some examples, some real life examples of positive correlations and negative correlations. I just want to point out that, um, that the, the value or the strength goes from zero to one, but yes. the linear correlation can go from negative one to positive one. Yeah. Negative one being a perfect negative correlation, so the line slopes down, and yeah. positive one being a perfect positive uh, correlation, so the line slopes up. So the, the values for the correlation can go from negative one to one. Yeah. But just in terms of their absolute value, zero yeah. to one. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so here, this is example two, and what we're going to do is we're going to classify the relationships between the variables. So basically what we're looking at is, is there no correlation? Is it linear? Is it nonlinear? If it's linear, is it positive or negative? Is it weak, moderate, strong, or perfect? Yep. So we're so using here, visual judgments. We're just looking yeah, at it. Yeah, we're just like looking a, at it, and, and we're, yeah. we, we could basically argue, you know, strongly or argue moderately yeah. as the case may go. Yeah. Now here in A, this yeah. is example 2A, and basically what we have is we have this cloud of data yeah. that is sloping downwards. If you were to draw an oval around the cloud, it would be a really narrow oval, and the oval itself would have the downward slope. So because of that narrowness or that tightness of that oval, then we're looking at the fact that it is kind of, it's either strong or moderate, because if you were to draw a line, all those points would be sort of close to the line. Mm -hmm. It does look linear. If you sort of squint your eyes at it, you know, mm -hmm. it definitely has a linear shape to it. Absolutely. So it's definitely negative and linear. And then it's just a matter of deciding, do we think it's strong or, or moderate to strong? Yeah, so I would say that this would be a strong correlation. I would too, yeah. If I get data that looks like this, I would say, holy cow, you better believe that's a strong strong correlation. So this yeah. would be linear, it would be negative, and it would be strong. Yeah. Okay, what about B? What about this set of data right here? Okay, so again, draw the cloud around it, like draw us an oval around the cloud. We can see that it's a general upward shape, yeah. and it is going upwards in sort of a linear pattern, mm -hmm. uh, but again, not as strong as the first one. Mm -hmm. And so I would say linear, positive, and maybe moderate. Okay. Or moderate. To and weak. we could even make you could even make an argument for weak. Yeah. Um, linear, definitely positive. Yeah. Um, and and this could be weak. It could also be kind of like a weak moderate. Yeah. Um, you could make uh you could make an argument for that. Now what about C? Is there any way of drawing? You know, like there is some kind of a pattern here, um, but then you got these two points out here. So if you really, you really can't put an oval, you know, you could make an argument, maybe you could put an oval here. Uh, but really, this is difficult. So for this, I would say there's no correlation here. Yeah, I don't, you don't see a pattern. Uh, so without doing the analysis mathematically, yeah. then yeah. we're going to look at it and go, oh, well, I don't really see much of a pattern there. Yeah. yeah. So another couple. Now, in, in this one, in D, to me, there is a pattern here. Mm -hmm. But the pattern does not look like... A straight line. This pattern looks like there's some kind of a curve in here, mm -hmm. and so I would say that this is nonlinear. Yeah, and now with nonlinear associations, we can't say positive or negative because it's it goes up at one point and then turns around and goes down again later. Mm -hmm. So we can't say it's positive or, or negative if it's nonlinear. But we could eyeball it and say, well, maybe it's like moderate or strong yeah. or weak. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, we'll look at analyzing this mathematically yeah. later. Right now, we're just looking at them. So what, what do you think about this one? Again, I would say I don't see a pattern. If I try to draw an oval around it, it just becomes a square. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I would say no correlation. No correlation. This one, now I think you're probably getting um, 
you know, an idea about what we're talking about here. This is a strong correlation, yeah. and it slopes up, so it would be positive. So this would be linear because um, it, it approximates a straight line. Yeah. It would be positive, and it would be strong. Yeah. Okay. The last three we have here, um, again, this right here, we could draw a cloud around this. Um, it's definitely sloping down, so I would say this would be linear. It would be negative, and I would definitely call this one a weak correlation. Weak or very weak. Again, we're, we're attaching descriptions to this yeah. that we don't have yeah. mathematical equivalents exactly. for yet, but we're going to teach you how to do that. Now, when we look at this right here, this is definitely nonlinear, but look at this data. If you, were to, you know, if you were to do an experiment and you got some data that was in this shape, this is very periodic you know, and, and, and replicates a sine curve or a cosine curve which are nonlinear functions. So this would be a very strong correlation, yeah. um, but definitely nonlinear. Non yeah. yeah. And what about this one? Same thing. We can see that it's creating a shape. It's, it's a predictable pattern. It decreases, then it increases. But because of the change in direction, it's not linear. Uh, we could draw a circle, like an oval around it, but we create like a hook shape. And it would be sort of a tight oval, right? So at this point, I could say, well, it's, it's moderate or strong, but it's mm -hmm. nonlinear. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Exactly. So you kind of get the point, you know. But again, can we take our descriptions to another level by including a little bit of mathematics? Yes, and the answer is yes, you definitely can. So that's what we're going to work on next. And that's basically looking at the correlation coefficient. Um, scatter plot can only give a rough indication. As you've seen, our descriptions were kind of a rough um, indication, right? Yeah. But a much more precise way is that we can measure the linear correlation um, by calculating the correlation coefficient, little r. Little r, yep. Okay, so it's a mathematical measure measurement of the correlation between two sets of data. It's a pure number. It doesn't have units. Okay, so it, it doesn't depend on the units or the scale. It just gives you the correlation between the two. Mm -hmm. So there's several ways to calculate it. Okay, um, we're not going to derive the expression. You know, we're not going to show you where it comes from. Your textbook does describe where it comes from. So if you're interested, look at 161 to 163. Mm -hmm. um, this is known as, basically, this, this measurement is known as Pearson's R. And, and Carl Pearson, it's named after Carl Pearson, he was the one that looked at standard deviation. He developed these formulas. Really, Pearson was a key figure in um, the development of modern statistics. But Pearson's R is something that, you know, you will come back to, if you take statistics, especially at university, university. you'll come back to it again and again and again. Um, but let's take a look at the equation because most of my students in the past, and I would probably say for you, most of your students in the past would look at this equation and think, yeah, right. you got to be <laughs> kidding me. Yeah. And uh, they don't look... In fact, this equation looks even worse than all the equations you've looked at for standard deviation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mean and weighted means and everything we did for last unit, uh, that you probably thought that was, wow, that's really confusing. I don't know if you get any worse. Uh, but here you go. Here's the R value. Here's how to find yeah. R. Now, this looks terrible. This is not as bad as it looks. No, as what you're going to see when we actually work this out by hand, yeah. it, you know, it looks very, very confusing. Um, but it's it's not that bad to deal with. To deal with. Okay. Do, and just to point out here that just like in the previous formulas, n is the number of data points. Okay. Um, x is your independent variable. Y is your dependent variable. And there's nothing else in here other than sums and products. Mm -hmm. You just need to know all your x values, yeah. all your y values, and how many points do you have. That's your n. And so we're just going to manipulate these yeah. values and we'll just create a column for each one, and you'll see how it goes. It's not so if bad. If you can add and multiply... You'll be good. ...and you're okay with bed mass, you're going to be okay. You'll be fine. you just got to be meticulous. All right. So, um, based on the result that we get, after we plug all kinds of data into that equation, based on the results that we get, we're going to get a number. That number might be positive. The number might be negative. But it's going to be between negative 1 and 1. Anything that's negative is a negative linear correlation. Anything that's positive is a positive linear correlation. So R is going to tell you whether it's positive or negative. Yeah. In addition, if it's a positive linear, excuse me, a negative linear correlation, 
and it's in these intervals, as you can see right here in front of you, then that's how we classify it as being weak, moderate, or strong. So if you get a negative number that's between 0 and negative 0 0.33, it's weak. Yeah. And so on and so forth. Yeah. Positive works much the same way. Between positive 0 0.33 and positive 0 0.67, you would say that's a moderate correlation. Okay, and now don't memorize these numbers. These are just thirds. Yeah. It's just broken into thirds. 0 0.33333, yeah. 0 0.66666. It's, it's just thirds, okay? Yeah. Bear in mind, you, you could probably add a few more labels on here. This would be a perfect negative. Yeah, like if you get negative, negative one, one, that's a perfect negative correlation. Zero is no correlation. So it's not even weak. It's none. Okay, and yeah. there's like a little window around zero where we could say none. You know, like 0. Yeah. 0.0008. We're not going to yeah. say that's weak, right? Yeah. And then one would be a perfect positive linear yeah. correlation. So you can add those three also onto this yeah. onto this chart for you. Okay, but don't worry about memorizing it. Just memorize the thirds. It's, thirds. it's broken it's a, into basically thirds. Basically, a rule of thirds. Don't overthink it. All right. Okay. Here we go. So this is an example, and we have two sets of data, and we are going to work through this now. Chances are, if you want to work along with us, you can. But we're going to go at a blistering pace because you don't want to watch us multiply and, and add. So basically, this is our new chart. This is the chart. With standard deviation, we created a chart x minus x bar, x bar, or x, minus mu. x minus x bar squared. squared. Take the sum of it, yeah. and so on and so forth. This is our new chart. New chart. This is what we need. So we've got x, y. x times y. x times y, x squared, and y squared. That's it. Okay? So, if we add up, are we doing sums first? If we add up, click, yep. yeah, so if we, if we add up all of x right here, yep. all of these points, add them up in the calculator, you get 461.8. Done. Yeah, that was click. fast. That yeah. was fast calculations, Mr. Jackson. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm like the human calculator. <laughs> I know. If I add up all of these, I get 1,110, okay? Okay. So, there we go. There's the sum of x, and there's the sum of y. That's nothing, there's nothing special nothing about fancy. that. Nothing fancy. Nope. Now, if we for each of these, we can then multiply x times y. So 54.5 times 186, boom. Is 10,137. And so on and so forth, multiplying as we go down the list. Okay. Let's add up all of these. And I get 63,345.3. So okay. that's the sum of the xy product column. Okay? Yes. So this is the sum of the xy product column. So if I take 10,137 plus 9,790, plus 9,614.8, and so on and so forth, I get this value down here, the sum of the xy products. Very similar, we can take x times x. So 54.5 squared is 2,970.25. I can square all of these values. This takes you a while by hand, but this Excel takes you a while. Is yes. So, so you're nice. starting to see where you know how this is going to take you a while by hand, but using Excel, it's going to be much easier. Yep. X squared. Then this says we're going to take the sum of all of these numbers, yep. and we do that. It's twenty six thousand seven hundred and ten point two eight. Very similar with y. We're going to take our y squared values, all of these right here, and we get y squared is equal to. 164,330. Yeah. Now let's make a note about taking notes. If you're convinced that you can multiply x squared and you do a couple of these, then you know doing the sum right here, just make sure that your notes are in a state where you could understand what to do next. Yeah. Because this is going to be a process that you would be asked to repeat on a test. Right. right. And again, we won't give you a lot of values for n, right? Probably less than 10, so that it oh, doesn't yeah. take you forever. Yeah. But we do need to see the process. So column yeah. headings, x, y, x squared, y squared, find the products, find the squares, find the squares, and then sum them. It's really just this bottom row, sum of x, bing, sum bing, of bing, y, bing, bing. sum of x, y, sum of x squared, and sum of y squared. Those are the values we're going to drop into the formula for the formula yeah. for the correlation yeah. coefficient. Yeah. All right, so here we go. Here's our formula. We need to populate this formula. Yeah. So just for purposes of presentation, let's get rid of this, yeah. send it off to the side, and let's bring up those bottom values in the chart here. Okay. So what this tells us, n, how many data points were there in that chart? There were eight. There were eight of them. Yeah. And this is saying, okay, so in the numerator, we're going to take n times the sum of xy minus the sum of x times the sum of y. So what does that look like? Well, here it is. 8 times the sum of xy. So here's the sum of xy right here. 
So we've taken this value and we've dropped it into the sum of xy. This is multiplication. That's all it is. From that, we've subtracted the product of the sum of x times the sum of y. So here's the sum of x, 461.8. Here's the sum of y, 1,110. And we put that in there. Yep. Numerator, done. Denominator. A little more work. A little bit more work. Just more bad math. Let's wrap the square root around the whole thing because we're going to take the square root of the whole denominator. Yeah. Here, in one little bracket, which we've got right here. The square bracket, the first square bracket. Is n times the sum of x squared. Well, here's the sum of x squared. So it's right here. And from that, we're subtracting the sum of x right here. All squared. All squared. Please note, now this is the yes. only this is the only place in this formula where students make substitution errors. After this, sometimes you make some mathematical errors with yes. your square roots, so you're not doing bad math right. But this, this is different from this. Yes. This is the sum of the x squared column, and this is the sum of x, whatever it is, all squared. Yeah. Okay. So when you write this, say to yourself, n times the sum of x squared minus the sum of x all, all squared. squared. Because this is the only spot where people make yeah. major errors in substitution. Yeah. Yep. And of course, if you get that, then the next bracket, which is over here, is virtually the same, except yep. now we're just going to use the y values. So we've got n yep, times right. the sum of, sum of y, the y squared. squared column. So there's yep. the sum of the y squared column. Minus... minus the, the sum, sum of y, y all, all squared. squared. Okay, so you can see exactly what we're doing there. Just take a note in your notes. Okay, yep. the very, very different will lead to very different results. Okay, so now okay. let's summarize and simplify our numerator and our denominator. Okay, so don't forget bad math. Do 8 times 63,345.3 yeah. and then subtract the product. Okay? Yeah, so, yeah. There, so here we, we're going to show you explicitly. Here's yeah. the bad math. This is what we get. Denominator looks like square root of these two numbers. So because these are both in big square brackets, we do this first. Mm -hmm. So okay. we've done the, what's inside the square brackets first. Now we're going to do the multiplication in the denominator and then take the square yep. root. Okay. So when we do all that, and we encourage you on a test or in your notes at, as you're doing your homework to show this in even three or four lines. Like yep. you don't have to do it all in one step. Uh, yeah. Because that way, if you make a mistake, you can go back and troubleshoot. So we get an R value of negative 0.99 for wow. this data. Wow. And so if we were going to classify this correlation, we were going to classify it, mm -hmm. we'd say, okay, well, it's definitely negative because that's what the negative tells us. It's a set. negative correlation. So whatever these two data sets were, they, they're experiencing a negative linear correlation. Yep. And it's strong. Very strong. It's a very strong correlation. Almost perfect. Almost perfect. You can't say that this is perfect. Though. No. You can't. Um, you would say that this is very, very strong. Yeah. So that's basically what we're going to use this for. And as you'll see in coming lessons, this is going to help us um, find that perfect line of best fit. This is the step, the first step towards finding that perfect line of best fit. Yeah. Okay. So whenever possible, we want to look for the, the you know, the scatter plot. We want to check for outliers and maybe even a nonlinear association. So the thing that we have to understand is that the correlation coefficient on its own, we just said it was negative 0.99. That's not enough. We should probably also have a scatter plot so that we can see what the number's telling us. And this is most valuable when you get an R value that implies that it's a very weak linear correlation. Because you can have a very weak linear correlation, but still have almost a perfect nonlinear correlation. Yeah. So the, the R value, if you're like, oh, you throw your hands up in the air and say, nope, 0 0.03. Well, that's terrible. There's no correlation yeah. there. No, no, no. R only tells you that there's weak yes. or no linear correlation. Yeah. You need to look at the scatter plot. Otherwise, yeah. you can't really tell if there is a correlation that's maybe nonlinear, yeah. and then you'll investigate other avenues. Yeah, like if we put data for like a cosine curve or something that exhibited that, what and we put that into it, we get a terrible R value. Terrible. But that doesn't tell us that there's no type, there's no association at all. It just tells us that there's not a linear association. So the other thing too, and the reason why in your notes this is in big, this is in big starred, <coughs> you know, bolded, bolded everything, because this is a very important moment that we're coming to. Just because you have a very strong linear correlation between two things mm -hmm. does not mean that you can say that then 
the independent variable, a change in the independent variable, causes a change in the dependent variable. You can only say that they're correlated, and they're correlated very strongly. Correlation does not equal causation. It doesn't, they, they don't mean the same things. And it's because, really, the type of statistics that we're doing, we don't have the right, using the statistics that we're using, we don't have the right to say, this causes this. Because a lot of correlations could be due to chance. Some correlations could be due to something else that's happening. A third factor yeah. that is actually causing the other two to rise together or fall together. And so really, in-depth statistics can help us lead to causation. And in-depth science and experiment, those can help us lead to causation. Correlation alone is almost like, you know, we don't have the right at this point with what we know to be able to say, this is causing this. Yeah. And the reason that we don't is because we're we just we're we are we are not basing it on enough evidence. So at this point, this is very important for this course. Correlation cannot lead to causation. Right. We can't conclude that X causes Y. Yeah. We can say that X and Y move together, or where you find X value here, you might find a Y value over here, but mm -hmm. we can't say Y mm -hmm. yet. So okay. a very good example of this. Ice cream sales. And crime rate. And crime rate. Now, in my first year psychology class in university, yeah. they showed us the correlation coefficient between ice cream sales and crime rate is very, very high. It, yeah. is, it is a fabulous correlation between ice cream sales and crime rate. And so the question he asked us was, does ice cream sales cause an increase in crime? Or would crime rates cause an increase in ice cream sales? And so... You know, why do you think that ice cream sales and crime rate move together so well? That they're so yeah. predictably moving together? What do, do you think? Yeah, and do, does ice cream sales, yeah, you know, when ice cream sales spike, does that make criminals... More active. More active. And so, so you why? Know, what, what are some of the explanations? And so, you should think about this. Mr. Smith, what do you think? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just glad you finally included me in one of these things. I've been sitting here for like three weeks. And yeah. uh, although, honestly, I kind of zoned out, I thought we were still doing one variable stats. Yeah. So why do you think, uh, we're, we're glad that you're included too, why do you think ice cream sales and crime rate might have a high correlation? Um, it could be that crime makes people feel bad about themselves. So maybe they want to get a little, little pick-me-up, go to an ice cream truck. And so that would be... Basically, what that would be is, um, you know, a common cause is that because crime relates to something else, that's affecting the ice cream rate. A very, very typical explanation for this is because um, ice cream sales usually peak during the summer months. Warmer weather. Right? Yeah. In yeah. warmer weather. Yeah. Well, it turns out that crime also peaks during, during the summer months, yeah. um, you know, for, in warmer weather. And so this is the example... Um, that's that's classic, that ice cream sales, you can't use a correlation to say that ice cream sales cause crime rate. Both of them change with the seasons. And so this is what's known as a common cause factor. And we're going to be explaining all of these things a little bit later on in the unit. But this is one of this is one example why ice cream sales and crime rate have such a high correlation. Thank you to Mr. Smith. Uh, I'm going to go get some ice cream now. All right. <laughs> and, and 